Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meet Social and Emotional Learning Podcast for our very first panel interview and episode number 177. those new or returning guests, welcome. I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator from Toronto, Canada, now in Arizona, and like many of you listening, have been fascinated with learning and understanding the science behind high-performance strategies that we can use to improve our own productivity in our schools, our sports, and workplace environments. This week, I'm thrilled to welcome back four guests to our very first panel interview with Horatio Sanchez from ResiliencyInc.com, Dr. John Leaf, MD from JohnLeafMD.com, Dr. Howard Rankin from HowNotToThink.com, and Tom Beekbane, the author of How to Understand Everything, Consilience, A New Way to See the World. This panel was actually Tom Beekbane's idea. After his episode 144 this summer, he mentioned he'd listened to Dr. John Leaf's episode on his book, The Secret Language of Cells, and he thought it would be a good idea if we hosted a panel discussion in the near future. Not wanting to miss any opportunity to learn something new, I agreed, and I wrote down the idea thinking of perhaps late fall for this panel discussion. When the timing felt right, I emailed Rachel Sanchez, John Leaf, Howard Rankin, and Tom Beekbane with this idea, and they all agreed immediately, and it was set in stone. Today, I want to welcome all four speakers to our discussion, and we'll give you their background so you can see where they've come from as you listen to their thoughts and ideas on this episode. The topic for today will be what is the most significant insight from neuroscience that can transform the future of education. So as I read through each speaker's bio, you can think of how their experience can contribute to this topic with some ideas that we can all take away and think about action steps that we can bring to our schools or workplaces. I really do believe that these ideas can transform our results and it just takes you, the listener, to implement one idea at a time for this change to occur. So here's today's panelists, Horatio Sanchez. We've had Horatio on the podcast twice before, so this will be his third episode. What I love about Horatio is that he was mentioned as an expert in educational neuroscience in our first interview with Ron Hall from Valley Day School, who said what he learned from Horatio changed the trajectory of his career in education. I just remember putting an image of him, Horatio, in Ron Hall's video, and I thought for someone making such an impact in the field I'm most interested in, I should learn more about his work. And that's where my friendship with Horatio began. You can listen to both his episodes to learn more. We've got episode 74, where we covered how to use brain science to improve instruction and school climate with a focus on his book, The Education Revolution. And then he came back on episode 111, where we focused on his most recent book, The Poverty Solution. Our next panelist, Dr. John Leaf, I was introduced to last summer with his new book, The Secret Language of Cells, that we discussed on episode number 143. His topic was fascinating, and it inspired me to write episode 147 on improving mental clarity by understanding our brain states, brain fog, and how it's created. And he gave me a new understanding of how our cells communicate with each other how T-cells send messages to the neuron to stop making so many memory cells when we're stressed, creating brain fog, and making me think of new ways to support brain health. I had so much feedback from Dr. Leaf's interview, and it showed how it opened up so many people's eyes to new ways to approach health and wellness. There's one point that I remember someone emailed me about, and it was how they were shocked to learn that scientists can observe immune cells in the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF, that bathes and protects the entire brain. The fluid was thought to function only as a protection for the brain when jostled. 
but now it's known to be a river of wireless communication with signals and coursing throughout the brain from all regions and all types of cells. It's now known that at most times there are 500,000 T cells in this fluid with smaller numbers of other immune cells. If you think this might sound a bit advanced, it's really not when we take the time to understand these ideas. Just this weekend, I was at a wedding with two of our friends who are getting married after meeting a few years back at the library while they were studying to become doctors. When the conversation at the wedding took a turn towards CSF and the brain, I smiled and remembered what I'd learned from Dr. Leaf. We can all understand how our brain and body functions so we can be in charge of our health and future. Our third panelist, Dr. Rankin, appeared three times on the podcast. First with his book, How Not to Think, and second when he interviewed me, and then thirdly with Grant Renier on their new book, Intuitive Rationality, Predicting Future Events with the New Behavioral Direction of AI. I immediately connected with Dr. Rankin as he opened my eyes to cognitive bias and ways that my thinking was flawed. I'm still not 100% sure how I'm supposed to think, but I know that whatever it is I'm thinking, it's probably wrong and full of biases. So I'll keep learning and hopefully with time and experience, I'll be all the more wiser. This will be Dr. Rankin's fourth appearance on the podcast, and I'm looking forward to the insight that he'll bring to the panel. I know he'll share his understanding of how we shouldn't think with our cognitive biases running our mental programming. And our final panelist, Tom Beekbane, and the one who came up with the idea for this episode opened me up to the fact that I don't need to know everything. And he gave me a sense of freedom with these interviews. His book, How to Understand Everything, stumped me. And I admitted to not being sure what consilience was within the first few minutes of our interview. Well, I think at the end of the interview, I had a new way of looking at the world through this lens of consilience, which reveals how things self-organize from the bottom up in contrast to how we think and communicate, which is top down. I'm certain there's more to learn from Tom and his way of looking at the world. I can't wait to see our four guests and see what they'll say about how simple neuroscience can transform the future of education. I want to welcome each of our guests to the podcast today for our first panel discussion. We've got Horatio Sanchez, we've got Dr. John Leaf, Dr. Howard Rankin, and Tom Beekbane. It's incredible to see you all today. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming back on the podcast to keep the conversation going with your books, your interviews, and the work that you've been doing since we last spoke. And I really do feel lucky to have this chance to speak with you again, because at the end of the interview, it's like I almost don't want to hang up with you. I wish that we could stay on longer and I wish I could keep asking you more questions. But I know that the learning will continue as we revisit your episodes reread your books and i do believe in lifelong learning but i'm so grateful for this platform to share your expertise with those who are tuning in all over the world so thank you again for being here today this just brings us back to our first question and it was actually tom beekbane's idea tom said we should get a panel together and ask each other questions and have feedback back and forth. So thank you, Tom, for that idea. And uh, thank you for ev everyone for agreeing to do this so quickly. So our first question, the topic today is what's gone wrong with our educational system and what's the most significant insight from neuroscience that can transform the future of education. And I want to begin with Horatio Sanchez because his work at resiliencyinc.com deals directly with educators and students in today's classrooms. So Horatio, what do you think? What's gone wrong with our educational system? Well, let me not say what's going wrong. Let me just put it this way. What's the biggest challenge I see? Um, if the goal of almost every teacher is to challenge students to reach their maximum capacity, have them experience enough success because the success secretes the dopamine, which causes them to be motivated. And that's why we see kids 
do homework in the subjects they're best at, not worst at. And then if they have patterns of success, they become resilient, they can experience a setback and continue fighting through it. So that's the goal. But now imagine me, a high school teacher. I have more than 30 kids in each class. I have six periods. In each class, I have um, some kids who are two years behind the subject matter, one year behind the subject matter. I have some amazingly high achieving students. I have some low achieving students. I have some second language learners. I have some kids with some cognitive um, issues or learning disabilities. I have some kids with behavioral disabilities. And you're asking me to take this curriculum and actually instruct it in a matter where every kid is challenged to their capacity. They all experience enough success to be self-motivated and then become resilient enough to withstand um, any kind of setback. That's a daunting task. And if you really start to think about it, I know some people argue, well, that's why diversification and we have um, diversified instruction. And I would challenge people to say, how do you take that and individualize it enough across such a wide spectrum of students, usually based on nothing but grade level? Usually curriculums go out and they are too much for some and too little for others. And if you really want to question diversification, usually at the end of a section, they usually administer one test, not a range of tests. Therefore, the biggest challenge I see is asking teachers to meet the need of such a wide range of kids without having a really good strategy for doing that. Absolutely. And as, as I come from the software development world, I'm thinking where there's individual paths for students with certain software programs, but not every classroom has access to these software programs. We can't individualize a path for every student that we have in our classroom. So what, what, you're say, what would be a solution then? Well, or clearly, that? families have to be involved but, uh, much, much, much more. And that means change in society, which I don't know what's going to happen. But I think Horatio and all the teachers are miracle workers and gurus. Um, it's unbelievable what you do. I mean, it's just remarkable. Because you do affect a lot of people. I mean, you know, even though it's impossible, what you've described, you do change a lot of kids, a lot of people. We struggle to get parents involved. I, I find the most involved parents tend to be oftentimes from the most highly productive students. Um, the parents we struggle to get into schools are the parents who have struggling kids or the parents who are working and reaching out to parents becomes extremely challenging. And I don't even know a good method for doing that right now because we've, we've tried a lot of different things. Short of a lottery, I don't know what else to do. Right. It's a societal problem. You know, it's very clear that the environment of the kid at home, you know, where they're there all every night, all weekends is vastly important in what you're trying to do. I mean, how can you alter that? I mean, it's it, it's really impossible what you're describing. And yet teachers do miracles all the time. It's it's really remarkable. Yeah, and I did a project in uh, the U.S. public school system about 10 years ago in a fairly low SES that completely changed my view on a number of things. Um, this was a project where actually one of the first using EEG brain mapping to look at the brains of some kids who were struggling and problematic in elementary school. Uh, before going into that, I would have said, oh, attention deficit, a way overdiagnosed, just give these kids medication and, and what have you. But there was something more than that. Most of these kids were basically elementary school unsupervised. You know, I would say to a mom, you know, they have to be at school at 7.30. It really needs to be in bed by, you know, 8 o'clock at the latest. And she said, are you kidding me? I don't get home from work till 10. Or, you know, a, a single parent, one, one kid was ra being raised by an obvious alcoholic and being totally ignored uh, at home. Uh, and other kids been raised by grandparents who really didn't have much of a clue. And so, you know, it's easy to sit here and say, 
oh, this should happen and that should happen, but we need to get into those districts, those schools, and see the reality of what's happening. And actually what came out of that study was rather than attention deficit being overdiagnosed, it wasn't being diagnosed at all. And the EEG was able to show these kids have it, but you know, single parents didn't know anything about it, couldn't afford help, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was really eye-opening. Well, it goes much further, even food, of course, is really important for education and they don't get good food and a lot of, you know, pollution is very important and they live in horrible near highways. So there's so many social factors that you're struggling with teaching kids. Anyway, it's, it's overwhelming. So I think it's easy, relatively easy as, as, as experts to say, well, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. It's obvious all these things need to be done. They do. But the context in which this is happening and operating in is vastly more complex than that. If only it were that easy, you know, I think. Yeah. If I could weigh in here, and, and I have to confess that I have nothing to do with the educational system aside from hiring people who are products of the educational system. And I've, I've spent 35 years um, observing um, the people who uh, come from our universities and high schools and then trying to work with them. And, and, and I've noticed that it's, it's, it's been becoming harder to find children, young people who uh, are motivated and realize that the world isn't, if you like, set up to make them succeed. They, they have to find success themselves. So I'm, I'm so much on board with what, what you folks have been saying. I mean, you need, you need good food, you need sleep, you need supportive parents, you need all of that. <clears throat> there is, th there's a, a change that's been happening in the educational system that I, I believe is working against kids. And, and I'll just talk about my experiences. And I have to confess that I'm extremely fortunate in that I went to absolutely first rate schools and universities. I mean, there were fee paying schools, uh, I, d I didn't have any of the, um, the, the, the the adverse effects that Horatio, you're, you're seeing, I think, every day. Um, but I was never given a multiple choice question in my entire education. Uh, I was very rarely ever given a mark and, and all, all of the other students were very rarely given a mark above 80%. Uh, we were not told that getting a perfect score was what education was all about. Uh, we were encouraged to develop our powers of observation, description, logic and communication. And uh, I always got the feeling that th this was a lifelong journey. And, and I learned science in a laboratory where there was never a question of something being right or wrong. It was a question of, well, you, you know, can you draw it? Can you express it? Can you communicate it? And, and, I, and I think there has been a massive change um, towards this sort of digitalization of knowledge. And, and I, I've heard you talk about this, Howard. And, and I, I, I think it's, it's um, providing kids with a misapprehension of the, the skills that they need and, and frankly, the skepticism that they need in order to forge their own path. So, Arisho, you talked a little bit about the, the path needed for each student. I, I kind of connected what I see publishers creating Tom's talked about, you know, his education, how it's different. We've talked Dr. Leaf about the parents and, and I, I feel like the pandemic really exposed where things are with the fact that it went online. Where do you think we are right now with where education is? And anyone? <laughs> you got us all stumped with that one. I'll, I'll weigh in a, a little bit and say that um, I, I think we should be working towards diversity and, and not uniformity. I, I, I think most kids 
um, and, and Horatio and, and, and professional educators have to, you know, correct me here. Most kids want to learn. Most kids want to have fun at school and 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 develop skills that um, are, are going to sort of help them be who they want to be. And the, the, the internet is now so rich in what it can deliver that I, I personally think that this whole COVID thing might push us towards allowing kids to pick the subjects that they want to study. And then their teachers should just as much as possible um, encourage them and champion them rather than sort of get them to score well on a, uh, a standardized test. I'd, I'd, I'd love you to push back Horatio because you know, you're, you're you, you have the real a experience. Pushback. It's just a clarification. I mean, I've been exposed to both ends of the spectrum. I went to schools that had the top performing um, people from the, my state, and we were all in high school. And in that school, you could set up exactly what you're talking about. All they were talking about the passion for learning and how we learned. And that is what I did for the rest of my life. That's very different than certain settings where students don't really, in certain places, you have to reconvince them that they want to learn. And, and so what we are finding is that we have to now teach teachers the skill sets to understand what they're facing and the tools to achieve that. And, and that's why this discussion today was somewhat important to me because I think we have a chance to start to look at certain things that we now know that's true about the brain to guide them. Because one of the things we now know is that we have lots of teachers out there teaching that don't understand necessarily how students learn because we have not done a good job explaining how the brain learns. And one of the biggest evidence of that is the fact that in, in America, we went through 20 years of hating the concept that anything should be memorized, <laughs> which is if you start thinking about the brain, that's one of the things that's just shocking to me. Then the other thing is we almost have eliminated repetition in America. If you and I are, everybody here in this audience right now knows how does our brain naturally learn things? Repetition is one of the things that even does it while we're sleeping to consolidate memory. We have eliminated it in hopes of doing nothing more than higher level achievement. But that's great for kids who have a lot of capacity. But for kids who don't have that, what we see now is that they're left behind because they don't even have the raw skills to be able to retain information and connect it, much less do advanced thinking. So we have some extremes here. I think it's very easy to do that. If you go to the, some of the best schools in America, and I've been there, all the things you're talking about are there. But you also have to remember most of those schools have gathered people who were there motivated, come motivated, and have done a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. We now have to equip teachers to understand how do I take a kid who is struggling with, with some cognitive issues and some basic gaps in learning, and how can I attack that while attacking and meeting the needs of all these other kids? And that's what I've been trying to help teachers with because those are real problems. We've uncovered what the major challenges are. And now I'd like to go into our second question. What's the most significant insight from neuroscience that can transform the future of education in these challenges that we've just brought up? And I'd like to begin with Dr. Leaf because I'm curious of his perspective from the secret language of cells and mental health that's critical for today's students or teachers. So Dr. Leaf, what do you think? Well, thank you. Well, I, I'm gonna briefly mention four things which are, could be each of them we could talk about for hours, uh, but it's it, we it's very much in sync with what Tom and Horatio and uh, Dr. Rankin are saying. So I'm gonna, the four things I'm going to mention is what do infants know at birth? What the second one is what is the unique brain development because we're finding a lot of unique brain development. The third question is how do lifestyle um, fit into what children need for education. And the fourth are specific 
things that would help with education. So the first one is what do infants know? So uh, infants know remarkably more than we thought before. They're much more intelligent, much more aware. Uh, speech, understanding of speech and math is far greater to the infant than anyone ever suspected. They understand abstract relationships. They understand already some of the vowels and words in their native language. There are, um, they understand uh, objects, how they interact. They understand people have mind. They understand uh, geometrical abstractions and concepts. And most importantly, from what Tom and Horatio said, they, they have a, st a statistical understanding, a scientific understanding of learning from statistically from their experience and making inferences. So that's, that's a big lump, but that's the first question. The second question is what is the unique brain development that is being found? Now, what's very interesting is that everyone thought in neuroscience that it's based upon usage and when they're born, they have to uh, learn this. That isn't the case. In the third trimester, the organization is already there. The cortex layers are already there. The gyrus are already there. There are frontal regions that are active. No one ever thought that because they thought the frontal regions didn't get myelinated until adolescence. But there are specific little areas that related to language and words. The other thing that is very vital is that words and numbers are highly connected in the brain structures. So when people learn words and they learn numbers, they're actually uh, strengthening each other. Um, it, it, the default mode network is already present, so they have a sense of self. So myelin, everyone knows myelin slowly grows uh, an inch, you know, a, a week or a month, and it goes from the neck, the neck stiffens, and the arms, then they sit up, then they stand, takes about a year. But no one suspected that in the frontal area of the language, it's already myelinated when they're born. That's unbelievable. Uh, it's totally unsuspected. Um, also, the first responses of the sensory system are not learned, they're already patterned. So the sensory already goes to these regions and they have unique ability to hear the words other, of all sounds, the words related to their language. So in other words, when they hear sounds, they can focus on the sounds related to words. Um, and that first response is, is remarkable. Um, Tom will be pleased to know that there are evidence of top-down uh, fibers influencing the knowledge of abstractions, which really fits with his wonderful book. Um, and uh, there's also right-left asymmetry, which was never suspected. This was all supposed to come later through, uh, through experience and learning. So I, we could go on on each of these, but anyway, the third area is what is lifestyle, which Horatio already mentioned, and we've already mentioned. So clearly sleep is absolutely vital for uh, reconsolidation memory, as already Horatio mentioned, and napping for infants is extremely important after they learn something. There's the window of neuroplasticity uh, after exercise. So kids have to exercise, and that has to be part of the picture, and now they're wiping out physical education, which is absurd. Um, the multi-sensory neuroplasticity, which I write about a lot, involves using more of the brain to learn more powerfully, which is why music, church experiences, uh, music concerts are so powerful in memories because it involves many, many parts of the brain. So this means that gesturing in particular, very important. Studies show that if, if in two math classes, if the teacher simply points at the blackboard, in one, it increases the learning of math by 25%. Um, nature is very important. It's not trivial. They have to have exposure to nature. Nature has a unique effect on the brain and without nature, exposure to nature, the brain just doesn't develop normally. They have to have meaningful activity as Horatio mentioned, and that's really hard to figure out how, how people are gonna do that. So now I come, and food of course is very important, uh, high fats, decreases memory, 
Uh, you need a certain amount of glucose to learn. Uh, there's some obvious things. You don't want to eat junk or, you know, the brain doesn't work properly. So the fourth area is what can, what specific recommendations can come out of this? Well, one thing is that infants already know a lot about language, relationships, mathematics, and social things. They already know this as infants. And therefore, speaking intelligently and using more words, words are key, more vocabulary, and particularly as they get a little bit older, words related to shape and size help mathematical ability later. So they need to have this size, the round, the sphere, the cube, the, you know, don't just give them a Lego set. This is a cube. This is a rectangle. This is a sphere. This is, and you point, pointing, because that increases the neuroplasticity. We have to allow their scientific inquiry, and they have to learn from hypotheses. Comparing hypotheses and then coming to conclusions is vital for infants to learn. It's very important also that they learn to plan. So four-year-olds can start planning, and this helps adolescents be much more productive. So that they should help plan their schedules. They should help plan what they're gonna do. They should be thinking about organizing their, uh, their day, for example, and talking about that. And exercises for impulse control in infants and for three, four, five, six-year-olds are very important for later adolescents. Uh, so comparing hypotheses, using a lot of words, particularly shape and size words for math. Uh, anyway, those are the recommendations that would come from the findings of the brain that we're seeing. Now, how to implement that, the society has to do that and the children have to do that. I mean, the families have to do that. No, no one person can do that. We have to all realize that kids need to learn a lot of words. The more, the better. I, I think some of that's going on. I mean, training teachers for probably the last decade on the maximizing sensory input while teaching, not making it just one form of learning and trying to really make that whole sensory input and grouping of sensory input to increase cognitive comprehension. And that includes things like gestures, touch, uh, movement, all those kinds of things. I think they, they've heard the, the biggest problem we see is that that model of, of I went through kindergarten, through college, being taught in a certain way, that model and that imprint is hard to change because what I found is teachers who hated learning that way turn out teaching exactly the same way because it's the only way they've been taught. The most creative teachers I've ever seen are were exposed to creative teaching when they were ch children. So I, I find the model of education is something that we have to start to change. And one of the things that we found is that one of the best ways to train someone in how to do something is have them see it done. <laughs> and so they have to be able to see it and there's not enough variance in the teaching. And a lot of what they see is exactly what we are trying to get them not to do. So I, I think getting more of that, this is how it should be done rather than talking to them having them be able to see it done to a high caliber will really help teachers a lot. Right. I, I don't know how you make things more meaningful, but clearly in the brain, if something's meaningful, it, the neuroplasticity is far greater. Uh, and I do completely agree with what Horatio said about repetition. You can't do away with repetition. <laughs> you can't learn math without repetition. Uh, so a certain amount of repetition has to be there, but also the experimental hypothesis, the exploring. Uh, so it's very complicated. Uh, but um, How, Howard, do you want to weigh in? We, ha we haven't heard from you for a little bit. Yeah. Because I've got lots to say. So I, I, could, I, I could compete with John. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'll try not to delay you. Um, I was a psychologist working on behavior change for 20 years before I realized something important. That all my knowledge, all my experience really depended on one thing that no one, and I went to the, some of the best schools, had ever mentioned to me, how to communicate. Uh, there's a book by two friends of mine, uh, Harold Stolovich and his wife, Erica Keeps, which is Telling Ain't Training. Telling Ain't Training. 
So I could have someone come in trying to change their behavior, but if I did not know how to reach them, all my knowledge and experience about behavior change was a waste of time. And so, especially in education, but probably in every human endeavor, if you are trying to influence somebody, communication is key. And interestingly, uh, Andrea knows this because I mentioned it on one of the podcasts, but when I was in clinical practice, I used to ask all my uh, education age from kindergarten to college, what was their favorite subject? And a lot of the time they came back with the same answer. And it's not a subject and it's not, it's not break or recess. And the answer was, the subject taught by my favorite teacher. In other words, when I had a connection with a teacher, I was engaged, I was interested, I enjoyed it, I learned the most. Bingo. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. Well, the idea is not complicated. Putting into practice is. But in some ways, we almost need to redefine what we mean by teaching. Because when we say that word, presumably we go back and think of our own experiences. And for me, sitting in British schools, even elementary school, it was sitting, looking out the window uh, in elementary school, looking at the seagulls on the soccer post and counting how many went in one way and out the other, while the teacher rambled on and on about something I really wasn't interested in. Okay. Yeah. I, I'd like to um, sort of develop those those ideas that that you each have have, have said and, and tie it in with my hobby horse, which is this this associated with this word consilience, because I uh, believe that we're at a unique moment in human history because for the first time we can actually get to see what's happening to a large degree uh, in the human brain. Now there are so many mysteries and 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 uh, Dr. Leaf writes about the, the wonders um, of, of cellular operation. And, and, and you can, you know, when you read your book, uh, Dr. Leaf, I mean, it, 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 it's just striking how much there is to know and, how, and frankly, how much more there is to discover. Um, but uh, my argument is that, that we can largely understand, understand how the brain works. And, and by that, I mean the cortex. I mean, there are so many mysteries. But that's that's the first time in human history that we've been able to claim that, I believe. And and, and what's what's become really apparent is that the difference between the human brains and the brains of other mammals isn't nearly as uh, as, as as big as we thought. We we are remarkably similar, you know, to your, your dog barking in the background, Howard. Um, and um, um, and, and, and what you realize when you look at uh, animal brains is that when we use a word like communication, communication isn't just words. It's, it's, it happens in so many different ways. And so, you know, Horatio, when you're talking about uh, how, uh, and, and John as well, the, the importance of all of the different sort of modalities, um, memorization, physical uh, activity, um, a belief and diet. I mean, the one the one thing that we have to get away from is this traditional view that the human brain is something like a computer and that it's a modular device. In in my view, that that picture of how the human brain works is dead. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone who um, is in academia realizes that, uh, and and I think that people like you, Andrea, can provide a really valuable service to academics and everyone who is interested in the realities of how humans behave, not the theory, not the old uh, sort of the mod modular computational, well, the brain, the brain is a repository of information and through, through knowledge, we um, can develop um, s sort of the perfect society. It, that is just not true. Uh, and, and so th there's a lot of correcting that needs to be done. Uh, and I like this word consilience because, because it's the jumping together of, of physics and chemistry and biology and history and, and, and archaeology and, and education. 
No, I think you're right. I think the modular theory is uh, wrong. Uh, they find cells in every part of the brain are highly connected to every other part of the brain. If you don't, if you put on blindfolds for a couple of hours, the cells are already changing to do something else than vision. They'll start hearing things or tactile. The, the brain is extremely active and uh, changing and, uh, and somehow it's based upon internal downward as well as the input uh, it, 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 it's unbelievably active. There is no module, there's no place for subjective experience. There's no place for consciousness. There's no place for intelligence. We have no idea what intelligence is. We have no idea what mind is. We have no idea in the current science. We have no idea what any of these words mean based upon our, you know, our materialistic science starts with matter and energy. And then the Eastern science comes from uh, consciousness and says it makes matter, but they can't prove that because we can't measure it. And so we don't know. And meanwhile, we're stuck measuring matter and energy and the theories that we have do not include mind or consciousness. And uh, all that has to change. And of course, it doesn't change when the professors, you know what they say about science, science no one ever changes their mind. The old professors die off and the younger professors take on the new ideas and grow older, but no one ever gives up their narrow views uh, willingly or they lose their grants and their money. Uh, so uh, yeah, we have no idea what consciousness or mind is, but we all do. I mean, we don't know scientifically, but every one of us knows exactly what mind is. We all know what subjective experience is. We all know the influence of subjective experience on everything that happens. Uh, but the society, the, the, the so-called scientists say it, it doesn't exist. They say mind doesn't exist. It's a, it's a robot, it's, it's, a, it's a circuit, it's a... So anyway, that was the purpose of my book, to just show how unbelievably uh, aware cells are. And now I'm delving deeper in how unbelievably aware molecules are, uh, which is very unpopular in the uh, current science. But um, anyway, no, I agree with what you're saying there. Uh, and, and, and you've picked the word consilience, which I guess E.O. Wilson also liked, um, and uh, to, to show the global understanding that things are not working the way we think they are and they're working from top down bottom up it's a I, I don't fully understand the word but I loved your book um, so uh, anyway I'm blabbing on too I'm ranting. if 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 you um if, if anyone's interested I, I mean my, my book explains sort of how consciousness has evolved and, and it's uh, you know it's, it's comparatively easy to understand. Like not not its spiritual connotations, but its functional and biological mechanisms. It's it's comparatively easy to understand, and and I think one needs to um, draw a sharp distinction between the material things of the world, the, the molecules, and and so on, and and human ideas, uh, um, because human ideas uh, evolve from experience and through social interaction, and that's where everything sort of uh, sort of comes together with with experience and, and, and whenever we look at something, you know, like each other, uh, th that experience is fertilized by a lifetime of um, interactions with people. Um, you only need to glance something for just a tiny fraction of a second and you know a great deal about it. And the reason is, is because you're just tapping into uh, your lifetime of similar experiences. So I, 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 I don't, I think that many, many scientists are sort of um, now glomming onto the idea that, um, that that consciousness isn't nearly as mysterious as we managed to. Um, consciousness think. also isn't in our brains. It's, it's each of us have some consciousness. We know that we we assume that. But meanwhile, in between all of these brains is culture and science and knowledge. All this stuff has been. It's not in my brain. It's not in your brain. It's in the sum of everyone's brains, really, uh, through history. So there is something bigger than mind. Uh, I mean, then there's something bigger about mind than our individual experience and our individual brains. And we tap into that. Um, you know, when you educate someone, you're taking the knowledge from everywhere, really, the, the, the gradual learning. Anyway, I'm ranting on as well.
We're not going to solve consciousness, but hopefully we can help kids uh, get a better education. So to sum up how neuroscience can impact education, I picked up a couple of things. Definitely, Dr. Leaf, everything you talked about where you took us through from infancy, uh, all the things that we need to be um, mindful of. And I, I actually thought about David Souza, who wrote How the Brain Learns, talked when I interviewed him about the importance of talking to our kids, using real words instead of just plunking them down and doing what we sometimes do that doesn't help them to develop. And then Dr. Rankin talked about being memorable with, you know, his example of, you know, what's their favorite subject. It's usually with that person that's their favorite because that person was memorable. And then Horatio talked about the importance of rep uh, memorization, repetition that we heard from Dr. John Denlusky's research on the brain and learning. Uh, what have I missed? Well, parents are talking intelligently to their kids. They're feeding them properly. They're involved in exercise. They're doing uh, inquiries. They're uh, learning from inference. They're uh, creating close relationships with, uh, with, with their students, uh, the memorable teacher. Uh, and we all have a memorable teacher. We think back, that's where it all started. You know, I was a, like a completely lousy dead student until it's one teacher in fifth grade, I think. And then after that, I got all A's because she liked me. I don't know, you know, and so Howard's absolutely right about that. So how we do that, I don't, you know, so it's like a guru. It's like a coach. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's like a community worker, someone who's meaningful, uh, someone who reaches the kids. And, and of course, we have a society where we, we don't pay teachers. We don't value it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Say the lowest paid health worker, you know, health aides and teachers, the two most important things in the world <laughs> are, 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 are very, you know, highly disregarded in our society. We only care about businessmen, you know, and uh, selling products. Uh, we don't care about health or education. Horatio, how do you do it? Because someone mentioned it was Ron Hall from Valley Day School. He mentioned in our very first interview on the podcast that he was like trying to figure out what session to go to. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go to this brain thing. And he was talking about it like it was going to be a bad thing because it was going to be boring. And then you completely blew him away with what you were talking about. So I know you know how to be memorable. But what do you think? How do you instill that in others? I have, I have, a, I have a true belief in that um, if you truly understand subject matter, you can communicate it to anyone. It is the person who doesn't understand something that makes it complex. So uh, I, I think when we talk about all the stuff of neuroscience, one of the hindrances often is, is the lack of communication. I communicate in the way where everyone knows they already know it because a lot of what we know about the brain we've lived through. And so when I, I bring them to points, I, I show them how they already know this because they've had this experience themselves. The problem with, I, with the instruction is a lot of what we know about the brain has to do with our experiencing of life, but we don't seem to apply that to instruction. And I think that is, that is the thing. I, um, how to make instruction be more experiential is one of the things I try to help them see because feel, taste, see, touch the lesson is one of the things I really want teachers to get into. And I found one of the best ways to do that is to, to do that with them and to them. And when I do that, I follow basically what I'm preaching by how I present. And I, and I just do it, you know. I also go to schools and I actually take a lesson and, and, and teach the lesson the way the brain would like to hear it. And teachers sit down and act like students and they, they see it and they go, oh, I get it now. But it's a, it's a lot easier to see it and have it done to you than explaining it. And I think when you really do understand it, you can explain it. And it's, I always tell you, it's brain science, not rocket science. It's, it's understandable. Yeah. And again, based on my experience, one of the things, and all of this um, that we've been talking about in terms of the sort of higher concept of communication and teaching and learning about the brain, I think is really excellent and on the mark. 
my experience of actually bringing in something like EEG brain mapping into a school was really interesting. I had almost every parent wanted to volunteer their kids. They were just fascinated by this. And I'll give you an example. Uh, at the time, uh, the EEG could show you very well a pattern of behavior that is absolutely correlated with attention deficit behavior disorder. And I had a, uh, a, a dad come in, I tested his kid, he had separated from his wife. Uh, his wife said, oh, you know, his Joe's got ADD and his dad said, oh, no, he doesn't. He's fine. He's absolutely, I can, yeah, that's, a, that's just my wife being my wife. So we did the brain map. And then I showed him the brain map. I showed him the different areas of the brain. And I said, this is classic attention deficit pattern. He started to cry. And he stopped and said, okay. I'll make an appointment today. Actually engaging that person, what his son's brain actually looked like and what it meant made a huge difference. And that this technology, and I know we're not really talking about technology, we're talking about some of these other more complex things. This technology has a role, a big role, and it is a way of introducing people to the concept of your brain and how it works, how the different areas work and what that says. And I personally think that that's valuable. So we, we covered the challenges in education. We covered some uh, neuroscientific findings. And now my third question kind of brings us to a perfect world. So I'm a big dreamer. I believe in dreaming big. It's usually what I say when I sign uh, one of my books because I believe in the possibilities in the world and that each person has tremendous power within them, that we can make a lasting impact on the world with whatever we're doing. And that's why I brought each one of you on because you're doing that with your ideas. And so let's just imagine that all of us were given a hundred million dollar grant. And I actually chose that amount because five years ago, I submitted an idea to the MacArthur Foundation's 100 and Change Grant Contest. And it was all with regards to making an impact on education with neuroscience. And it was an incredible experience to even figure out where would you distribute the funds? What would your idea be? And how would you split them up? I had all my former sales managers on, on calls to figure out what we would do with this idea and split up the funds. And I know where my idea fell short, but what would you all say? What would be your plan? Can I give a little story? I'm yeah. sorry. So many years ago in the, in the 60s, when deinstitutionalization was occurring for schizophrenics and the big state hospitals, they did a study called Ward H. And they gave a, a mental health center in the Midwest a lot of money at that time, like you're going to give, although 100 million isn't a drop, it's a drop in the bucket for this problem that we're talking about. You're talking billions or trillions, possibly. You have to change society, but th th this is instructive. So in mental, in state hospitals, there was a stratus. There were the Jewish doctors, the WASP administrators, the Irish nurses, and the Black AIDS. And they never talked to each other. None of them had anything to do with each other. And they were all ignoring each other. The aides were the ones actually dealing with the patients. The nurses were giving pills. The doctors were doing what doctors do. And the administrators, who knows what they were doing. Anyway, they gave them money to completely change the structure and form groups where everyone talked to each other. Really great, touchy-feely groups where the nurse's aide was given power to make decisions about what happens to the patient in conjunction with discussions and treatment planning with the doctor and the nurses and all the things you would think we should do and that are logical and that would be nice to do in a mental health system. Three years this went on and it was miraculous how changed everything was and how the patients got better. Unbelievable. The schizophrenics became uh, you know, were able to function. They were given proper therapies. They, you know, schizophrenics benefit from therapies, although that's been forgotten because the pharmacy companies eliminated all the therapies. Anyway, so make a long story short, 
It's working perfectly and beautifully for three years. The money runs out within one week. It was back the way it was. Everything just flipped back into the social strata that existed because of the racism, the culture, the blah, 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 blah. Just the, uh, the sociocultural stratification was overwhelming and the entire thing flipped immediately without the constant input of paid groups and you know touchy-feely things and exercises and all that. Anyway, that, I'm just saying that 100 million to me is a drop in the bucket. We have to change society, really. I mean, you're talking about major changes here. I, I find when you start to look at problems and you make them that big and you say it that way, it makes the thing so daunting that people do nothing. Uh, I, I, I don't, I just can't fathom that. My, my, my view of the world is that we got it. We can make changes. We can make it in a myriad of ways. And the bigger and the more overwhelming we make things look, the less the brain will find solutions. So my approach is the exercise here is pretty simple. It's not the magic and the money. That was is the example is all she wants to do is hear your big idea of what could change something. And, and I think that's a fair statement. Let's what could we do, not what we can't do, because what we can do is more important to me than what we can't. Well, I applaud what you just so what said. you got. Uh, okay, okay, so uh, uh, go for it, Horatio, and, and then let's hear from Howard. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm okay. fascinated. If, if, if I would look at it. I, I like the idea of making education a total immersion kind of thing. And I, I'm, if, I, if we had all the resources in the world, all those aspects that we do with kids make them totally part of the education experience. For example, instead of lunch being lunch, lunch is something that teaches about good diet and good health. Have them learn about food, have them eat healthy foods and learn that it can be tasty and and have the food experience be something. Have our emo social emotional learning be part of understanding how does the brain make connections? What are good ways of communicating? Practice those skills. Have them learn things like how do I take care of my body and how are things to practically practice those things while in school? Have the education experience be experienced as much as possible, have all those aspects be experiences that they do where the whole learning thing is a lab. And there are two components I would throw in there in almost every school I'd go to. They would be have dual language all the time because I adding a language I think is wonderful for the brain um, and have it totally immersion. I don't care what languages you pick, just pick two and go with it and enhance the music capacity of schools because I think there is a lot of value in that. And I think just having the whole experience be as much experiential rather than didactic. And, and I think that is what I would love to see. Um, I mean, if I had a hundred million dollars, I, I, would, I would make available some of this sort of easier, cheaper uh, EEG brain mapping thing. Not to say that it's, you know, perfect, but I think where it's been shown over time to at least be indicative. I was just thinking of a situation actually with my son. He went to Montessori school and the teacher came to us and said, well, you know, he, you know, he wanders around. He does. And I said, well, he's bored. And she said, you can't be bored at Montessori. <laughs> so, okay, we haven't tested. His IQ is 154. He's bored. Okay. So we need some of we need we need some of that for sure. But I completely agree with what Horatio said. It's got to be immersive. Okay. It's got to be at a personal, you know, it's it, it, communication at a real level. That's where people learn. And that's where people learn to learn as you know the fact that so many of uh, the kids that i saw said my favorite class is taught by my favorite teacher how we do that i know that would cost a whole lot more than a hundred million dollars i don't know i think Horacio probably knows but absolutely i'll I'll, uh, I'll weigh in here and and say that uh, even though i'm a business person 
I think it would be better to keep the hundred million dollars because as soon as you put money like that on the table, that becomes the focus. And, and I think one of the problems in the educational system right now is that the educational system is the focus rather than the kids. And we, we I'll, I'll just give you a little story. Uh, my wife has been teaching science for the last 20 years with a, an enterprise called Scientists in Schools, which is like, in, in essence, it's a volunteer organization. So she is, has been into many hundreds of schools uh, teaching, what, five to 11 year olds. She's probably taught over 100,000 students um, science, the, the sort of science, basic science. And every evening for the last 20 years, I've been hearing these stories about how different each of the classrooms are. And the, the biggest factor is the enthusiasm and the engagement of the teacher. If you, if you throw money at that, you don't necessarily get a more engaged um, and enthusiastic teacher. Quite often you get someone who's just more interested in the money. Uh, and a big factor that my wife always mentioned was that the neat classrooms, the well-organized classrooms, were the ones where the kids were best behaved and learned the most. So it doesn't cost anything to clean up a classroom. Uh, and so I, I, I'm just sort of echoing what Horatio was saying, uh, that I, I think that the emphasis has to be put on the kids, their families, uh, and good teachers, rather than the establishment, rather than the institutions of education, because they tend to sort of feed on their own dynamics. And, and I personally feel that when I interview kids, if, if they sort of believe their education too much, they uh, make terrible employees. So our final thoughts to close out this episode. Uh, we've identified some challenges. We've talked about some neuroscientific findings and you've each given some big ideas on how you'd make these changes. Let's close out and just think what would be your final thought on the changes that you think are possible in education with neuroscience? I think they're all dependent upon Horatio. He's there, <laughs> he's, there. he's in the trenches, he's doing it. I second that, Horatio. It's your responsibility. <laughs> and, oh, great. <laughs> and he's great. And he's oh, doing great. it. And uh, it's people like him that will make the difference. Oh, I, I, actually, Andrew, I think what should happen is this episode should be played in every school. Uh, there you go. Except for what I said on a big screen. I want to thank every one of you for coming on our first panel interview so we can all continue to learn from you, keep the conversation going. I, I think we should all follow each other on Twitter. If anyone's watching and you're, you're not following, I'll make sure I'll put all of your Twitter handles because you can see the work that each one of our panelists is doing. Um, a ratio deep in the schools, you can see him traveling, you see him at the airports, you see all the work that um, Dr. Leaf is doing and, and Tom on your book with consilience and Dr. Rankin on how we can change our thinking and, and improve what we're doing. So I, I thank you all for coming on the podcast. And I hope those listening can take away some ideas to think about and implement right away so that we can make changes that I know are possible in our schools and workplaces. And, and one thing, Horacio and your colleagues and Tom's wife, thank you, because it's easy yeah. to sit and be critical. It's hard to be in that classroom, and mm -hmm. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, we can't sit here right. and I'm say, sorry. oh, you should be ideal. This is nothing. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I one, of my, one of my nieces is a, is a teacher, actually two of them. And I, I just, they're just amazing. I mean, it's, that's, that's what's important in life, in the world. So to close out our very first panel interview, I ask each one of our panelists a question. Let's hear what they have to say. So how has what you've learned about the brain personally impacted your life? Hmm. 
This might sound overblown, but my growing understanding of the human brain has helped me understand everything that I experience. In particular, it's helped me make sense of my own and other people's reactions to topics that are divisive and controversial. So let's pick a topic that's, uh, for instance, COVID vaccinations for children right now. There's nothing more controversial than that. Some people think they're reasonable and necessary. Others think they're wrong. And each of us has an instant reaction to the words. So when one understands the nature of perception and its purpose, which is to move appropriately and rapidly, one can figure out why we react like this. So this means that I feel less anxious and I'm able to discuss matters without getting angry. And on the whole, it means that I'm more tolerant of diverse opinions. And sometimes, although not always, it makes me more patient. Well, the biggest lesson that I have learned particularly recently and in large part to Dr. John Leaf is the brain and the body, the mind and the body are so intimately connected. It's a massively intelligent system that we have no real, most people don't have a real understanding of the complexity of it and we need to take care of it very well. And of course that is eating, eating the right sorts of healthy foods, physical activity is as important, sleep, stress management, and the appropriate amount of stimulation. So that is critical. Uh, at the level of education, what I have learned, and I learned it as a student going through high school, but I couldn't articulate it then, is you know, telling ain't training. Telling ain't teaching. Telling ain't influencing. You can tell somebody something all you want, but you know they may understand it at some superficial level, but it's not going to engage them. And that's not what education should be about. We should be about looking to really fully engage people, fully engage their brains, so that they really do want to understand the subject matter rather than just recite a fact. And that goes right across uh, many sectors of uh, society, not just education. In the field that uh, I was in for many years as a psychotherapist, it took me a long time to realize that communication and the way that I presented things to people was really key in whether they're going to be motivated to follow my advice or not. Nobody had ever taught me that, which is why I now have a course in communication for professionals, because just telling ain't motivating, ain't training, and in many ways ain't reaching people. And this is the big lesson now that uh, for me is a very general one, goes way beyond education, but it is very specific to education, we need to convey material in a way that fully engages the student. If we don't, um, there are going to be a lot of kids uh, like us in future generations that, I don't know what I got out of that course in school. I didn't never use it, never do anything with it. No. If it's just a sort of dry, boring fact, you're not going to. So that's my take. Probably in a couple of ways. One is that when we look at now and understand how active the brain is and realize that everything you think about and what you do with your brain will determine the kind of circuits you'll develop and what, will, what it will become over time, that it leads to more uh, interest in uh, controlling uh, the use of the mind towards positive things rather than negative things. And along with that is the fact that trauma, traumatic experiences can be decreased by understanding that we reconsolidate new memories with new cells. And we do this every night really. And it, it, we can add positivity to traumatic experiences. But probably the most important thing is that when I learned about how connected all the cells are and how they talk to each other, that 
it's very obvious to me that nature is, although there's some competition and survival of the fittest, nature is really based upon cooperation of cells through cells, through microbes, through viruses, through tissues, through brains, through bodies, embryos, it's all cooperation. And that the mind works that way too. It's in between all of us and it's based upon cooperation. So I, I see that I'm hoping that will help influence the world a little bit and to see that we're all connected. How has neuroscience helped me and impacted me the most? I would have to say in social. I've become better at understanding people, human behavior, and that has impacted me on a personal level. I have become more attuned to those amygdala moments when the emotional brain overrides the cortex, and I can see from people subtle changes in their voice, their posture, their facial expression, that they're having a level of emotion that actually would not be a good idea for me to engage in any kind of contradiction or debate. I've become sensitive to people's emotional cues and try to respond to meet people's needs a little better. I've even gotten a little bit better at noticing when people are experiencing a subconscious bias that is so emotional that it actually is influencing their perception of what's going on. And most importantly, I become conscious of when I have that happen. I become conscious of when I have probably had a subconscious bias and just being able to recognize it and say, how can I prevent that from happening in the future? So for me, the impact of understanding and studying the brain has helped me be a better person socially and being able to help and support other people, but most importantly, improve my own social behavior.